Now this morning, I came out to the garage because I know yesterday I got done with the ride and I knew there'd be some salt on the bike. I didn't want to let it sit in. And I usually like to do this right after a ride. Obviously family life didn't work out that way. But as I went around the bike, I said, oh, you know, I may as well do a thorough job today because I'm going to have some time this morning. Not going to do it right now, but I will have some time. But the, the point being that the roads are still salty, and I couldn't believe it. The tires, when I got home, the tires still had that little salt crust around the edge and everything. And, and the exhaust pipes under here, that makes me crazy that we have to live in a world with salt on the roads. So the plan is, and I did spend a lot of time doing most of the cleanup. I think I'm pretty much done here. I'm just looking around because my, my master plan today is the temperature went way down again. It's not really a great day to ride anyway. Temperature went down. I was hoping today two things. I could finish off Vlad's parts. That'd be nice. And then the next day, get started with our assembly. Boy, that would be really nice. But you never know with my life how things are going to play out. There's always a, a mystery meet at the end of it. So as I'm out here checking on all the children and rubbing noses and... Uh, Checking everything, <laughs> I'm telling you, this has been an unpredictable weather-wise year. I never, never expected these warm days that we had, and then just when you get excited about it, you get up in the morning and it's freezing cold again. I mean, it's cold too. But I had, I had something really worth sharing that I think is funny, and I want to show it. I and I'll just give you a, a little idea. When Vlad was here with the parts, the first thing he told me is they were Aprilla parts. And I didn't know what that meant. I, had, I know what Aprillas are, but I didn't know what... And then he said it's an Aprilla Mondale with a Honda engine. So I, I was confused. Eh, but I don't need to know this. I'm not a collector of exotic bikes. So it just happened. We've been corresponding back and forth about these Mondale parts. It's Mondale motorcycles. Now, I know Mondale from... The book Ray gave me, or loaned me, that they go into detail about Mondale. They had a successful racing 125 and whatever. And, and so I go onto the, the internet, look up images of Mondale, and there's, the, there's Vlad's bike. <laughs> and they he said they only made 140 of them or something, and he's got one of them. So can you imagine those parts that we're working on? Maybe the parts will even finish up today. Who knows? They, that's a pretty rare bike. I didn't realize it was that rare. But anyway, just something of interest. If you don't know about Mondale, look it up. Pretty interesting stuff. And they do have a racing history, which I have, doc I have it documented in that book downstairs. But the thing with it, every day, there's always a surprise. There's always something I never thought was coming my way. And I, I'm not a a uh, historian like Dale is of the history of motorcycles, but I like to know as much as I can. So all the time I spent on the original detailing and cleanup, now a cleanup or a detailing after a ride, almost nothing. And we still get to ride a clean bike. And there's just nothing nicer on these older motorcycles like the Nortons, the BSAs, the Old Triumphs, than the polished aluminum. That is just such a nice feature of older bikes. And when you do it and maintain it throughout the life of the bike, after at some point in time, it's very easy to do. And we already have the waterfall run and try to clean up this algae bloom that we have in the pond. But, but with the temperature down like this, who knows? It's all mystery meat. And once again, thank you, Ray, for the loan of this book. I found it really, really useful and fun, adding to my knowledge of these older motorcycles. Uh, at least I can have a beginning conversation with Dale when we go up to the motorcycle museum. So here's the history of the 125cc Mondale and some of the pictures of the original bikes. This is, of course, re relates to the carbon parts that we're doing right now for Vlad. Something interesting, and I'm reading this information right out of the book. 1948, the Mondale four-stroke beat up on all the two-strokes. Boy, is that a, that's a change of pace, huh? <laughs> Mondale. And in 1957, they were one, two, and three at the World Championships in the 250 class. Quite interesting stuff. I'm sure Dale knows all this stuff, but it's very interesting to me, and I wouldn't know it except for Ray being generous and loaning me this book. 
But that's the whole point of everything, is I do like knowing about all different types of motorcycles and all different uh, history of motorcycles, old and new. And why do I get the, the feeling someday in a black and white picture like this, they're going to say, well, there was Wendy Ertnowski with his GS1100. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe Dell will be in that picture, too. <laughs> Maybe Dallas will be in that picture. Dale, Dallas, and Wendy. Anyway. That is a little bit of the history of Mondale. So this is an image from uh, Google of the, the, this is the model that Vlad has and the, the parts that, that, that we're doing for him are going on this bike. And it's a, quite a cool looking bike. And there's their street, street Fighter version. I'm not so sure about that version. Anyway, I was I was able to learn something by looking at several of the uh, advertisements of these the Mondale bikes. I really was not aware how many models they made, or uh, a very high end bike, of course. But uh, anytime I can add to my knowledge of motorcycling, and anytime I can share it, even better. And that's the that's the model Vlad has, and that is quite a cool looking bike. I like how the exhaust pipes come right out the tail. Kind of cool. It's a V twin. So Vlad, I really, uh, I know you're looking at this video right now, and I know I look forward to seeing this bike uh, when we do have a ride together. Get some video of it and ride it safe and in good health. A lot of carbon fiber. Look at that blue seat. That blue seat is actually pretty cool. It looks like a Ducati 999 with the two little round headlights. It's a Mondale. And they make a lot of other stuff, scooters and cars and whatever. It's a cool website to look up. And it may be that they're connected to Aprilla in some way, because in the very beginning, Vlad, when, before I realized what this was, I thought that the, the way you uh, identified this, it was an Aprilla Mondale. But, boy, I was wrong. And I know Vince has a really nice Aprilla, and we've ridden with him many times with that bike. And there's the one I'd like to have in my garage. <laughs> well, will you be a hit, hit on a hit parade with that? Very cool. Very, very cool. Mondale. And the only thing I really wasn't able to figure out from this website was it says some of them are made in, in India. It doesn't say which ones. Maybe they're all made in India. I don't know. But anyway, that's just some information to share. Hope you enjoyed that part of it. We have carbon fiber parts to make. So there are three more Mondale parts to buff out here, and we will be yeah, if not today, today or tomorrow, we'll be finished with this and Vlad can pick them up. And maybe he'll have some more pictures of his Mondale. Anyway, that was interesting information. And to be honest, I, I was unaware of all of it. And everybody knows nothing really productive is going to happen in my shop until I have a cup of coffee. That Mondale information was good information. I've enjoyed that and there are several other videos on YouTube you can check out. So if this day goes as planned, our Mondale, this is our Mondale right here, <laughs> a, little, a little less money too. And if the day goes as planned, and, and it almost never does, because what's happened is because of the virus thing, they've shut the, the school down, and Miles is uh, basically homeschooling now from a computer. I don't know how good that's going to be, but I don't know what the kids are going to need me to do. It may affect my babysitting schedule, so... I don't know yet. We're gonna. That's all to be proven. But I hope if the day goes as planned, tomorrow we'll be putting the forks and wheels back on a bike, and that'll change everything. I think. But you never know how a day is gonna play out in my life. Every day, and I, I really do like it that way. But I do have something I want to share, and I think it's something really important before we actually get started here in the shop. Now I thought I'd share this information. A lot of my friends have GoPro cameras. Everybody I know has a couple of GoPro cameras. I've even given some away so that other people could have them. And it's, I've had so many of them. I, I bet I've had 20 of them in uh, over the time we've been shooting video and putting it on YouTube. I wanted to share something though. Over the years I've made a lot of camera mounts. If you've looked at the video, especially some of the older ones, camera mounts low on a bike, high on a bike, on the gas tank, on the mirrors everywhere but the one i like the best and this is this is really good information i think to share is when it's mounted in a spot 
and I try to make the majority of a ride video that it's it's as if you're riding the motorcycle and where I, f I found out a couple of things that really over the years the, the, and the reason I'm sharing this is this morning I went and watched Mondale video and there's a Mondale video that somebody shot from the gas tank of the video and it's a nice they're going through the Mount, Rocky Mountain roads and everything I love the video except the, the camera's mounted on an egg beater. Well, what I found, and, I, and Rich Peabody and I have shared many of these informative things. He likes to shoot video too. The, the biggest thing of all is to keep the camera from vibrating. And what, what is very useful is to have it mounted to your jacket. I don't like it mounted to the helmet because your head is moving and you always feel like you're swimming or you're on a surfboard instead of a motorcycle. But what I found works great very low tech and it works the best for me I wanted to share it this is mounted now this is the key thing I have a remote mic the remote mic wire mounts to the SJ cam and w where the microphone is is on the bottom of the jacket that's the microphone if you don't have a remote mic the sounds from the front of the jacket doesn't pick up as well as it does if you have the remote mic. Now I used to have it in the back of the collar. In fact, there's still a piece of tape up there. <laughs> the I used to have it in the back. Eh, it better. Better than having no microphone at all. But the best one is to have the microphone mount. I found this and if you look at the last say six months of video, it's been mounted right here. And that really gives you a good rendition of the sound that's coming out of the motorcycle. But here's what happens when the when the camera's mounted up here and these things usually come with the camera. And what happens is some of the cameras are a little bit different, but here's the problems you can have, and here's the solution I found works the best. If you just mount this to your jacket, it's going to do this all through the ride, it, and, and your, your footage is going to look terrible. Well, the way to solve that is I put a piece of carbon fiber on the back with some soft rubber pads so that presses on your body, and it just it acts like a big rubber cushion. And I always have my little straps, these little Velcro straps, because believe it or not, I have lost cameras. Cameras have come off. And these things that they sell you, yeah, they're not really made for motorcycles at 100 miles an hour. So, or if you're, if you're leaning the bike or whatever. But this worked out great. It's kind of self-explanatory, or as young people say, intuitive, to figure out how to do it. I always have these little pads so that I don't have any bolts pressing up on my chest but this is something that if you if you engineer this up correctly have a little velcro strap to hold the camera on and if you have a, like an sj6 cam which is the one i use and the remote mic is a ten dollar option you can mount it there you'll get great sound and the video will be i think my video now forget about everything else forget about the fact i have no personality and and i'm not uh, george clooney the footage itself, I think most of it is pretty good quality footage. And most of it, except for the few we have one mounted on a swing arm on the R1, is one mounted by the muffler. Most of it comes from this jacket cam. And the thing to make it even better is put that, or you could even use a thin piece of plywood or anything really, just so that camera can't do that. And I like to have it that it's tightly mounted, but that it's not doing this all during the ride. Now, I also have a summer jacket, similar thing on a summer jacket, mm, mm, mm. but but this actually worked out pretty well for me. Now I'm I'm just sharing this because of watching that Mondale video this morning and saying, here's a guy with a really really expensive motorcycle, and he's a really really good rider, and he's really in a beautiful part of the country. I'm sure it's Italy or somewhere, and and I love to join him on this ride while I'm having my coffee, except. I'm losing the fillings in my teeth watching them go around corners. And yeah, it's a twin, and I know I understand all that, but had he had this jacket mount, I think the footage would have been a lot better. And it'd probably take an hour to make something like this up. <laughs> now, here's some of the things not to do, and I'm because I'm trying to share useful information. I originally made this thinking, aha, I'm really a smart guy. I attached Velcro to the jacket and Velcro to the back of the camera. And what happened? When I took the camera off the Velcro, it pulled the back of the camera off. <laughs> that's, that's a true story. I lost a $22 camera to in that. 
So, and the little strap, because I have lost the camera and I looked down one day and there was no camera. And when I, this is a true story too. When I went, I found it. I actually found parts of it all over the place. I still have it. I came home, I taped it all together with tape and it still played, except the screen in the back that had, it was broken. So anyway, interesting stories, interesting stuff. Mondale, now that we're working on, this is going to be one of the last days working on Vlad's part, maybe the last day, depending on how Miles' issue with not being able to go to school is. It's, it's going to be a variable day. I have no idea where this is going, and I like it that way. So there's three parts left of this job, and I think I can get, get the smaller, the medium, and then we'll save the biggest one for last. And if we get all three of them done today, that will be wonderful, but I never want to get to the point where I rush this kind of stuff. This kind of work takes time. And as I try to do on every video, I try to show one in real time. And I always try to show the material we use. It's in DASA 2000 Rhino Wet. This is the, there's two grades of this paper. This is the red line. It's a little bit better grade of paper. And I guess if you can tell, it's red. <laughs> Great, really intuitive thing they did to uh, name it the red line. Ordinary warm water, a couple of drops of Dawn soap, and we're ready to go to work. Now, anytime I'm doing one of these parts, I always try to because the logic, my logic is that there's new people to our channel every day, and they may not know the routine that we're using, so I don't want to skip over it. So for the people that watch every day, or well, regularly anyway, uh, you just have to put up with a minute or two of boredom because I do like to show this stuff in real time. And again, this might be the last day of sanding carbon fiber here for a while, so I don't know. If we're gonna be able to get this stuff done today, that'll be very nice, but we're not, certainly not gonna rush it. The riding season's really not here yet anyway, and I know, knowing Vlad as I do, he appreciates the high quality work that we do in this shop, and I appreciate that we share the same passion. So here we are. With, we're coming up on a home stretch of Vlad's project, and a lot of hours went into this. I, I'm not sure how many you see on video, if you can estimate how many hours, but when I looked at the video of this motorcycle, and so I looked at all of them that are on YouTube, and I said, yeah, this is a pretty exotic bike, and having this really nice carbon fiber on it is really going to make a difference. If there's another person anywhere in our area that has one of these bikes, and they park them together, guess what? <laughs> and I guess that's the whole idea of owning exotic motorcycles anyway, is so you can do stuff like that. Oh, okay, so here we are, and I wanted to show this. I always like to show this up close. It's up close and personal time. And we need flat, shiny. When it's all flat like that, we're ready to buff. Got the good news about doing things by hand, like this hand labor. <clears throat> you really get to detail a part out really nicely. If we were doing this with a machine, uh, it would be nice, but, but this is even nicer. And a good example of those wheels, the R1 wheels, the FCR wheels. Uh, I'm not sure there's any machine in the world except for a mouse with rubbing compound on his feet or something that you could use. But... This is a part of it that's kind of an old-school, old-fashioned skill. I doubt that the modern generation is going to be all gung-ho to become motorcycle restorers, and uh, I'm not sure. But I know from my generation, the people that like to restore these old motorcycles or keep them, they they want to keep them till the day they die. It is That's just the way it is. And the skill of being able to do this helps you do it to whatever bike is your favorite. Now we should be coming up on pretty soon. In fact, we're we're close already. Get some of this dried off and take a look at it. I think we're pretty much pretty much ready. Okay, we're basically ready to get out the buffing compound and get those arm muscles flexing. And these are the products that we found work pretty well for me. The Meguiar's works pretty well. Those are probably my two first choices. 
And then always when the part is done, a hand buff it out with some flits. That's for protection. This, this is to get the shine to come up from the 2000 grit up to shiny and then to lock it in with some 6000 grit flits. Now once you have the part and you have the material, and by the way, the last time I bought this, it was about 50 bucks for this. And it'll, it'll do at least a whole motorcycle, that's for sure, or a car, or maybe more. Yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, a little piece of scrap microfiber. I want to do one little piece in real time. It doesn't really matter. We'll spread this around. You don't really need gallons of this to do it right, but you definitely need some elbow grease. So I pick a spot. I want to do this. I want to show it in real time. And then I can basically go, uh, well, now, in, if we were doing a model airplane, the whole thing would be as delicate as could be. Good thing about some of these motorcycle parts, they're pretty sturdy. So you get a good grip on it and you can put your weight into it. If we were doing something delicate, you just have to be a little more careful and a little more delicate. <laughs> it's hard to figure out, huh? <laughs> anyway, it was very interesting since I've had the experience of working on Vlad's other exotic bikes he's got benelli's and he's got motors and and bm those rare bmws that are a million dollars and whatever who the who the hell even knows because that's that's a part of the motorcycling world that's part of the buffet i don't go to that that trough i kind of like my stuff that's very inexpensive i do the work myself and then i then i really feel like i can ride the hell out of the bikes without worrying I think if I had a real expensive bike, I wouldn't want to really ride it that hard. And the whole idea for me is just to ride it within my skill level. So, And to be able to videotape it and share it with our friends and who don't live in this part of the country and don't know what we experience, the ups and downs and the weather. and the, I do enjoy that. And when I see other people that are spending a lot of time and energy and money and everything to try to make a nice video to share with their friends... And we just met a fella, uh, Jason, who's got a 650. Met him up uh, at the bike meetup, and he had two cameras on his bike. And I, uh, I'm looking to see if he's ever going to post anything. Because when you mount the camera right to the bike, there's always some vibration. You, uh, The human being, you become the rubber biscuit that's the interface. So, like a Norton engine. Anyway, we're going to let me get this out of the way. See if we can show this in real time successfully. I always think that's the test. And if we can show that, I'm not sure we were able to show that shine, but now we've got 45 minutes, an hour of hand labor here to detail this part out. Now what always takes a lot of time on these is the valleys. The valleys, for some reason, you spend a lot of time getting down into that, I don't know, the ditch or the valley, whatever I, whatever you want to call it. But again, with the, the, the kind of work, this kind of work, you just have to be patient. And boy, in the end, you've got something. That's the bottom line. The bottom line to everything is you got something. And I don't know how to explain it to people that don't understand that or might not understand it or... They, they they have a different philosophy or whatever. I can only share the way I feel. I don't know how other people feel. I don't, it's not for me to figure out or be judgmental or whatever, but I know what I like. And when I wake up in the morning, I know what I like. And I guess that's, that's part of why I'm happy. Anyway, this is going to take just a little more time than you always think, ah, oh, it's going to go quickly. And... Yeah, you start doing it, because eh, there's a little, eh, little spot there I want to address, eh, a little spot there. And, and in the end, you're glad you did it. And the last step on this, as always, a good coating of flits. And this will be, now we're down to having two parts before we're done. Vlad, start the engine. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I remember a time, and I've, I even have it on video, I think it was when we were doing some bikes for Mark Morgan, that we had three or four bikes here at the same time, and one of Luciano's, and one of Glenn's, and one of Vince's wheels, and boy, there were just, there were times at this, when springtime came, I was glad to get all the stuff out of the shop and get into the riding season. Well, you know what? As I get rid of the projects, and I'm very close to having 
the 650 project done and believe me I'm itching the only trouble is the, the weather is not as itchy as I thought it would be now once this is done and we can take a close look at it and see if it's exactly if there's any spots we need to go over and I concentrate on the areas that you really see these areas that go behind the mirrors and stuff you're not really gonna see that so it's not a big deal but I would think at some point in time I would think that would float your boat Now the next part we <clears throat> next part we have to do here basically the same thing hand sand it out 2000 grit and detail it out make sure there's no dust no little flaws in the paint and whatnot whatever and and do that hand buffing finish it up with flits and boy I'm, th this is really coming out nice I think Vlad's just gonna be thrilled with these parts and I know when this motorcycle is put together because Vlad is one of the people I know that's very fussy about his equipment. He never shows up with a bike that's all rusty and dirty and, well, we share the same passion, I guess is the right word. And this is just, we get to the point with this where at some point your arm starts getting tired and you need to take a coffee break or uh, whatever. I'm not sure. Boy, but I remember when I was younger. I'd be able to do this for hours on end and now <laughs> not so much <laughs> not really so much anyway this thing about the uh, because they shut the school system down and they're doing the schooling by computer I still have to find out if they're gonna want me to uh, do some babysitting or what what's going on here so uh, if, uh, even if I get these two well I'm hoping I get the three parts done today but that'll be a major major thing boy oh boy and this is just, this at some point in time just turns into a labor of love. Now just like with any hand labor operation, there's always spots in corners and edges and usually it's valleys. It, you really have to spend that little extra time doing this. At, uh, I, I wish there was a way you didn't have to do it, but that's the way it is. And sometimes the big flat areas go pretty quick. I think I'll be able to use a buffing wheel on that, the hugger. I only got one part left to do, but these parts, just way too delicate, way too delicate for that. Now, while I was busy buffing away here, Vlad called. And I told him how these parts are coming out, and he's pretty excited. He's already looked at, I am assuming, looked at some of the videos. And he says, I'll be there tomorrow for sure. <laughs> I know why, because he wants to put these on the bike, and I don't blame him. And he's really, not just, the only thing left on this part is the flits. Then I'm going to take me a break, because, boy, my arm is, this, this is taxing, taxing on a senior citizen arm. That's all I can say. I'm glad, I'm glad I'm not a baseball pitcher. Maybe this would be a good career if you were a baseball pitcher. You could get into high-quality buffing. I don't know. I don't know these parts are coming out like jewelry, though. I'm sure he'll be happy with them. So the final result on this, even even as I look at it now, wow, that that is a high quality finish by any standard you have. And knowing that these were used parts, these were not even new parts. And the one little spot on this that we had to repair, the, uh, the way the carbon fiber was cracked, that came out perfect. Time to call in the relief pitcher on these carbon fiber parts and give them two cups of coffee. All right, the last part on Vlad's job. And see, all of this has to be done by hand. And you got to be careful you don't go through over here. So, yeah, we could use a buffer over here, but prob probably it's not even going to save the 10 minutes by doing that. And I thought this was even very, very cool. Even in these little recesses, there's a little drain hole because if you left this bike out in the rain, this would fill with water. Nice little quality touch. So, I've had my coffee break. It's time to get back to work. Now, this is one of the only flat parts of this whole job that you can really use a soft block on. And I may as well. Now that we have the relief pitcher in on my body double. Boy, I need a body double. Jeez. Boy, for any of my friends that are getting old, 
it, it ain't as much fun as you thought it would be. I don't know. Anyway, we got a flat sand the whole part down. And I am ready. I, I know Vlad is ready to snap these all together and get riding his bike. I'm always excited when I have a new project. I'm excited about putting our bike together, maybe starting tomorrow. You never know how the weather's going to play out. Because this time of year, you do get riding days, and when you do, you never throw one away and go work in a cellar or the garage. You go riding. Well, as I'm coming down a home stretch on this job, I'm really happy. This this was a lot of a lot of little extra cuts and angles and edges, and this is probably the only easy part of the whole job right here. So, because I have a relief pitcher here who's had six cups of coffee, I figured I'd finish this off and give Vlad a call at his parts. He already knows I can he can pick them up, but I am happy because I know he's excited about getting this bike put back together as we everybody who's ever taken a bike apart and uh, done some work or added accessories or you know that that passion and that's the passion we share and without that well I don't know I don't know because I don't know what it's like not to have that passion I'm always thinking about something I want to do let's see how that buffed up really not that big of a deal to do it by hand now let me just show that and that's that is truly the answer the true labor of love one of the things that always takes a little extra time on these type of parts is getting the edges nice and smooth i don't want to have anything that isn't just the best i could possibly make it on this job and it just, if there was a simple way to do this, yeah, well, we'd probably figure it out if you could just make it jump out of a jar. But unfortunately, this is the only way I know. Now, if somebody else knows a different way, I'll be watching that YouTube video. Boy, be sure to send me the link. But when I see the guys like Ammo NYC detail on a car and they spend 20 hours to detail something that most people would never even see, well, then I really know they have the passion. And a part like this, yeah, there's, there's just no substitute for just detailing it out by hand. As always, there's always some spots that are just really difficult to get in and get all the edges. And this is, this is it looks like this would be a real simple part and you just have no problem doing it. It's to get it right, it just, it's just a lot of little extra steps. Like making fine wine, it just doesn't jump off the grapevine and jump into your glass. Now, as I'm finishing up this part and getting the flitz on it, I just, this, this is a real watershed. Having this project that ran over the course of a couple of days, two or three days, I don't remember. But, boy, it's, this is, these are some really nice parts, believe me. These would look good on my bike, in fact. And I got to learn all about Mondale's, and who the hell knew? I thought it was Walter Mondale. Shows you what I know. I thought it was in Aprilia. It's pretty funny, dude. <laughs> the only person I know that's really knowledgeable about this stuff is Dale, because he runs the museum, but don't ask me. Anyway, I wanted to show this one little thing. Maybe this will be inspiring to you. I don't know, but it's inspiring to me. I'll be very happy to see how how Vlad likes these parts. This will be a real... Here we go. Let's see if you can see that. Not sure you can see it, but... Well, at the end of a, a really long hand buffing job, that, that makes it all worthwhile. And I can see myself... Look at that handsome guy. God! And I, I will be very happy to see Vlad's face when he gets here and checks this out. This is a whole lot nicer than when he brought it here. Well, when you think of how much effort went into these carbon parts, that I'm sure if, if Vlad parks next to another Mondale, and there's only so many of them in the world, uh, I'm sure the guy's going to run over and go, wow, where'd you get those carbon fiber parts? <laughs>
I always think that. Anyway, this has been an exciting project to work on, and it took a lot longer than I thought it would. I know Vlad will appreciate it, as he's done with all the restoration stuff I've done for him. And I hope by sharing it with you, you've been entertained, been inspired, and your passion grows with every day. So thanks a lot for watching, and that's all I can say. Video over.